have been some whispers and murmurs over the course of the last couple of weeks that the president would consider pardoning Julian Assange, though the U.S. government is still officially seeking his extradition. Assange is the former head of WikiLeaks, which published the classified files leaked by Chelsea Manning, demonstrating that the U.S. government had misled the public about the war on terror. Now, Assange has been in hiding and or some form of incarceration since 2011. With us now is Gabriel Shipton, Julian Assange's brother. Welcome to Rising. Yeah, good to be with you. Yes, so great to have you. Please give us an update. Obviously, we're hearing a variety of things, um, including increasing pressure from some members of Congress, some advocates in the public to actually finally have Julian Assange be free. Though, while the legal matter is still being worked out, we are getting closer, in fact, to the point where if push is going to come to, sho uh, sh to shove, he would be brought to the U.S. Uh, ostensibly for prosecution. Well, that's right, yeah, the prosecution and the extradition is moving forward in the United Kingdom, but I think there's a real, uh, it seems like a bit of a shift here, a moving of the ground uh, with these comments uh, from the President last week when he was asked uh, if he was considering the Australian request uh, to drop the charges. He said, yes, we're considering it. And so that was, a, you know, I think a real moment uh, in this campaign to free Julian. Uh, there's also been uh, the Wall Street Journal, who has a source inside the DOJ, has been reporting on different uh, types of plea deals and things uh, that uh, the DOJ is apparently considering. So I think there's a real shift uh, and people, there's a focus on it now. And as this extradition moves closer and closer to happening, uh, May 20th, is there, there's another hearing in the UK where Julian could be extradited. I think uh, it's becoming a real political hot potato uh, for the Biden administration, I don't believe they want a uh, you know huge press freedom First Amendment case uh, arriving here uh, during an election uh, season. I think that could be very worrying uh, f for them, particularly when they're trying to frame uh, the opposition as being you know uh, anti press freedom um, when they've got uh, you know arguably the most famous journalism in the world, journalist in the world, uh, being held in a UK prison and possibly being prosecuted in the Eastern District of Virginia. That's such an important point. I mean, so much of the media cycle back in 2016 and somewhat in 2020 was about Donald Trump antagonizing journalists, having the cameras turn around and point at the journalists and heckling them at rallies and things like that. And I think you make a strong point there that it confuses the Democratic Party's message a great deal if they're now responsible for prosecuting the most famous journalists in the world. Tell me how you're feeling about it, though, because because there was this, this idea floated um, that Joe Biden kind of said off the cuff that he was considering it. He has in the past made kind of off the cuff statements uh, at, in, in gaggles that the, the administration has later had to walk back. What's your impression on how considered that statement actually was and how much real movement there is ongoing right now? Well, I think in terms, I think it really speaks to what's going on inside, in potentially inside the administration that Joe Biden made this off the cuff, the re, off the cuff remark, without actually considering the separation of powers and mm. things like that. So, uh, I think it's an indicator of what is actually happening inside the administration. Uh, you know, that comment was then baked in by the Australian Prime Minister, who came out and said, "Oh, we welcome, uh, we welcome that, uh, we welcome that comment," as well as the Defence Minister of Australia, who was actually in Washington at the time said oh, we, we welcome those comments. Uh, the Mexican president also made comments saying, you know, it'd be, uh, you know, an amazing stand for justice that, that if Julian was freed. So I think it's, you know, uh, you know, more sort of illuminates what's going on inside the administration. But yeah, we saw uh, these sort of comments trying to be walked back a bit in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there was an article on the 14th. Um, you know, saying that the Australians had asked for a plea deal, uh, which which wasn't the case. It was the question was actually about dropping the charges. So, I think there's some interesting dynamics, and the separation of powers uh, is definitely uh, you know the DOJ definitely wants to be seen as independent and definitely wants to make the decision, the final decision on, on this, and so they should. The U.S. officials uh, recently, I think, just in the last day or so, um, kind of promised informally not to pursue, to the British legal officials, that they would not pursue the death penalty against Julian Assange, which is, I'm, I'm sure, welcome news, although in this context is almost a way of assuring the British legal system that it would be okay to hand Julian over to U.S. prosecutors. So while it, it's 
good that the death penalty would be ruled out. That was actually made in the service of still ostensibly bringing him to justice from the U.S. government's perspective. So is, is it, was it a mixed bag in, in that sense? Well, uh, the, the U.K. courts have done this really strange thing. Rather than approving Julian's appeal, uh, they had an uh, appeal application hearing, and then they said, OK, uh, you know, you've got two worthy points here uh, of appeal, uh, but we're going to give uh, the US government an opportunity uh, to give us more information in these uh, diplomatic notes uh, to sort of you know, address these appeal points. And that's what we saw with this death penalty point. They said, this is a valid appeal point. We can't extradite Julian if he's going to face the death penalty in the United States. Uh, and the other one, which I think is uh, quite interesting, is that uh, they said that uh, we can't extradite Julian uh, if he's discriminated against for his nationality. Uh, and what that means is that the prosecutors have argued, because Julian is not a US citizen, that he is not entitled to First Amendment protection. And so what the UK courts have said is that, well, we can't extradite him if uh, you're going to treat him differently than a US citizen in, in that regard. And so the DOJ responded, or not the DOJ, but the American Embassy responded uh, in these diplomatic assurances saying, well, Julian is free to argue uh, that he has First Amendment protection, but that's up to a judge uh, whether he does or not. And we already know there's jurisprudence that uh, there was a Supreme Court case uh, between Open Society and USAID where they found that First Amendment protection can't be extended uh, to US citizens. So I think that could be a, a, an area where uh, the UK could potentially block this extradition uh, because uh, Julian will not have First Amendment protection uh, if he is tried here in the United States, which could be really embarrassing uh, for the Department of Justice. And Julian's wife responded to these assurances saying that it was weasel words, I think pointing to the squishiness of saying, well, he has the right to argue these first, uh, on First Amendment grounds, but it's up to an individual judge. What happens if, because those assurances are vague, at least the, the First Amendment assurances are up in the air, what would be the next step if those assurances, frankly, were not enough for the UK court? Well, that's where it gets, um, I think, you know, potentially even more embarrassing for the US DOJ because then they would uh, potentially approve Julian's appeal on that singular point, and then you would have an appeal hearing uh, that would have to go in uh, to the publications and what Julian is, is charged with. and really delve into that and see, is it uh, protected speech or is it protected uh, under the European Conventions of Freedom of Expression? And so then you would have an appeal hearing playing out uh, that would put uh, at odds these European freedom of expression laws with the, with the First Amendment. So uh, I'd, I'd, yeah, it could be uh, you know, a very interesting appeal uh, if it gets approved. But that being said, uh, the UK courts have really uh, you know, been part uh, they've been the sort of uh, instrument that's been used to really deal out the persecution on Julian, to keep him in prison for these last five years. Uh, you know, he's not serving a sentence. He's not charged with any crime in the United Kingdom. But they've able to, been able to keep him in a maximum security prison. So I don't have a lot of faith uh, in the UK courts and the UK justice. Can you speak to the role the Australian government has played in this process so far, uh, Julian being an Australian um, citizen, and there has been, it, it seems, sentiment in Australia is very much in favour of him, letting hi, uh, let, of letting him go free. Uh, can you speak to that? Well, just so a poll after poll in Australia has shown that the people of Australia actually want Julian returned home. It's a very, it's, uh, Australia and the US have a very close relationship uh, you know, we're both English-speaking countries. Uh, we have this new, uh, this new tri-party alliance, AUKUS, Australia, UK and US. But this is one of the points of contention uh, in the relationship uh, between the United States and Australia. Uh, just last February, the Australian Parliament put through a resolution. Two-thirds of the Parliament voted in favour. And that resolution was calling on the UK and the US uh, to bring this to an end and uh, return Julian uh, back to Australia. So. I think there is very, very strong support uh, for Julian Australia in, in Australia. The government has been advocating for him uh, in their talks here in Washington. Uh, the, the ambassador here, Kevin Rudd, has been working hard behind the scenes to advocate for Julian and for his release. And so I think, uh, you know, in terms of the State Department relationship and 
and uh, the US-Australian relationship, this, I think, returning Julian back to Australia could uh, have, there's a lot of goodwill to be taken up there. And, and that could really bring these two countries closer together. And it would seem like such an easy thing to do, especially after such a long period of Julian being in prison, you know, being punished just by mm. not being charged. Um, the, the person who, who leaked the information to him, obviously having been prosecuted, spent some time in prison, and then was pardoned, commuted, is now free. You know, e even if you did think there was some criminal element to this, which, to be clear, I don't, that, that that person would have been engaged in the more obviously criminal action, and now that has been forgiven and is is a is a done is a settled matter. So to to still be going after Julian, to be having these three different governments from three different parts of the world involved in this effort that has brought embarrassment, I agree on on to the United States, the United States government, a, a at a time where the Biden administration, Biden is running for re-election on uh, up holding democracy, uh, the threat to democracy that his opponent represents, and he has to be involved in this. And my, the question is why? <laughs> Can't you just easily say enough is enough, this has gone on long enough, so many people are advocating for his freedom, and we can just say it was a First Amendment issue and it's done? Yeah, and I think that that's the sort of reality and the writing's on the wall now. The political cost of this prosecution is now outweighing the benefit. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of goodwill to be taken up by the Biden administration. You know, we've We've had the entire, the entire progressive leadership in the Congress have written to Biden uh, about this issue, calling on him uh, to bring these charges to a close, you know, calling on Garland uh, to drop this prosecution. So I think in terms of the goodwill, the political goodwill available for the Biden administration domestically, I think that exists as well. You know, you've got all these press freedom organisations, ACLU, uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation, human rights organisations like Amnesty, have all wrote, written multiple letters to the Biden administration. The New York Times has written to the Biden administration. So I, I think there's a, a huge amount of goodwill out there f for the administration to take up uh, you know, during this election season. Yeah, you mentioned the Progressive uh, Caucus coming on support of uh, Assange. There, we have seen in the last week or so, however, that there is a significant appetite among national security hawks in Congress to double down in, this, in the context of this FISA mm. uh, argument, right, where there is a substantial core of Republicans and the, some Democrats along with them that aren't especially moved on the question of whether or not these kind of um, uh, protections against uh, the overreaches of the national security state are valid and need to be addressed. So I wonder what, in your experience, are some of the points of pushback that you're receiving from a congressional perspective? Do you think that if the DOJ is seriously considering this, that they will be getting pushback from certain sectors of um, elected officials in Congress? Yeah, I, I do think they will be getting pushback. If, if this eventually, if Julian's eventually extradited, it's it's going to be, I don't know how the DOJ is going to, you know, uh, continue with this prosecution. I think there will be quite a bit of pushback uh, domestically. Uh, you know, you've seen, like the, like I said, the New York Times has come out and said this. So you'd, you'd expect there'd be considerable reporting on it, unlike the Pfizer, uh, unlike the Pfizer um, you know, moment that was had. But, I, you know, there was pretty, I think it was pretty close, right, the Pfizer mm -hmm. vote. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's, there's a huge constituency that, that is against this. Uh, is against this sort of thing. Um, and I, I think the constituency that is actually pursuing Julian uh, has been falling away and has been, uh, has been reducing. Mm. Uh, you know, the Mike, Mike Pompeo, who was sort of, you know, went off the deep end back in 2017 and issued this sort of fatwa against WikiLeaks. Like, he's been off the scene for quite a while now. Uh, you know, he's a sort of, um, you know, he attempted a presidential run, released a book, but didn't get much traction. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the constituency that is really pushing this is, is, is falling away. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the constituency for Julian is actually growing. So, Yeah, I, I've certainly seen on the Republican side um, the civil liberties contingent you know, emerging a little bit in the FISA discussion. Obviously, we wish there were even more of them and it was even larger, but um, I, I do see that momentum taking place, and uh, we'll just see if that's enough to finally have Julian free after so long. Gabriel Shipton, thank you so much for joining us yeah, today. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you.